Welcome to POTUS 2017, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, Trump Care 3.0. The GOP has long insisted that Obamacare is in a death spiral. But our guest from 538 says a close read of the administration's own data says it isn't so. We'll talk to her in a minute. And later in our evidence-based politics segment, we'll examine a New England Journal of Medicine paper that details how Trump care could make the opioid epidemic worse. For context, let's begin with a legislative update on repeal and replace. In an attempt to pass Trump care and address other matters, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has cut in half the summer recess for our 100 senators. They'll remain in session until the third week of August. Should be easier to get a dinner reservation in Paris now. Just teasing. Hard at work this week, McConnell is releasing an update of his American Health Care Act, which will now keep in place a couple of Obamacare taxes on upper income people to finance more health care for everybody else. GOP moderates may like that, although Senator Susan Collins of Maine, a key GOP moderate, has already said the changes are not enough to win her over. Meanwhile, Senators Ted Cruz of Texas and Mike Lee of Utah, arch conservatives, are proposing an amendment to have insurers offer as one option the full Obamacare package. Interesting. Provided other plans can be sold without preventive care, mental health care, substance abuse treatment, or other Obamacare guarantees. We'll try to explain. Not sure how that will go over if it happens. Next week, the Congressional Budget Office will figure the price tag of this newest plan and estimate how many people would lose coverage. The last version had 22 million losing coverage. All right, we're up to date as of our deadline. Now let's throw some data at this repeated assertion. Obamacare is in a total death spiral. And the problems will only get worse if Congress fails to act. But is Obamacare truly in a death spiral? This is crucial to whether the eight-year-old vehicle must be junked or can be repaired. Joining us via Skype from Santa Cruz, California, Anna Barry Jester. She reports on public health, food, and culture for 538, the website that crunches data on everything from politics to sports. Hi, Anna. Thanks for coming on the program. Hi. Thanks for having me. So 538 is a data site. How do you quantify death spiral? Right. So I think it's helpful to kind of define what a death spiral is first. So that's this term that was used before the Affordable Care Act, which um, essentially it's, you know, the prices go up on a health insurance premium. So healthy people who don't need the insurance as much leave. That means leave sicker people behind and then the prices keep going up and that kind of escalates until you get a plan that's too expensive for anyone to afford and it collapses. So... There's a couple of really important things here. So first of all, um, Obamacare is the Affordable Care Act, which is a lot of things. The marketplaces that we're talking about are one piece of that law, and they're the most public piece. But when we talk about Obamacare being in a death spiral, that's referring specifically to these marketplaces. And so the thing about the marketplaces is that most of the people who are on them, who are using them, receive significant subsidies. And so when the prices go up, they don't necessarily feel that cost because they are paying a percentage of their income no matter what that premium is. And so what this, what um, in a report that was released by the Center for um, Medicare and Medicaid Services last week showed was that the mix of patients who are using the marketplaces, so the sick and healthy um, patients, has been pretty stable from 2015 to 2016. So that kind of suggests that you don't have what this idea of a death spiral, right? That you don't have the healthy people leaving and the sick people staying. Partly because um, Obamacare requires young and healthy people to buy insurance. That's the individual mandate, right? Right. The other thing, though, is that just because a market is stable doesn't mean it's working for everyone. And so people get really upset when you say, well, the marketplaces are stable, because there are a lot of people who are middle income who are not receiving those subsidies. So it's not like they don't feel those price increases. They do. But the thing is, most of those people were not using the marketplaces to begin with. So even as those prices have gone up, there's been very low uptake. So even in people in the sort of like 
35,000 to 48,000 a year income who technically qualify for some subsidies. Only about 15% have been using the marketplaces of those who could use them. So it's, you know, it's this weird thing where on one hand, yes, the marketplaces are stable. They're not in a death spiral. They can't really be in a death spiral because you the people who use them don't pay those full prices. They don't feel those price increases. On the other hand, the marketplaces are not working for everyone. And they're not working for every place. We're starting to hear stories of some states where there's only one insurer willing to stay in those marketplace uh, exchange uh, insurance markets. And in some counties, I believe, there are now zero. Why is that happening? Right. So that's a really important point, too. So there's about 40 counties right now that don't have any insurers planning to use the marketplaces next year. And they're mostly very rural counties. So they have very few people who would be using these plans anyway. That's not to say those people don't matter, but more that there's less business interest for the insurers. Um, there's a pretty clear line that states that have been less supportive of the Affordable Care Act and kind of rejected some of um, the provisions of it have had uh, not have had um, have had trouble keeping insurers in the marketplace, um, but yeah, there's you know there's real concerns for in Nevada and some other states that um, they they could end up with counties that don't have insurers, which means those people can't get subsidies unless there's some kind of fix, legislative fix. Were, were you indicating a minute ago that those states where the governors took the Medicaid expansion, that's the public insurance Medicaid for people with low enough incomes? but that that decision affected whether the private exchanges are functioning with enough private insurers on them? So it's not just the Medicaid expansion. So, you know, one of the things, for example, is that you need people to sign up for these marketplaces to work. And to get people to sign up, you kind of have to advertise to them. And different states took different approaches towards that. So, for example, California went really all in on this, and so did New York. And they've really done a lot of outreach to try and get people to sign up. Other states did less. Now, that doesn't mean that that totally determines how well the marketplaces do. You know, Southern Florida is doing great, and they that Florida took one of the sort of strongest anti-affordable care act stances, um, but there are some there is some correlation between sort of how you know how much effort a state put into making the marketplaces work and whether they you know are working and whether there's a lot of insurance um, insurer involvement. But rural areas have some particular challenges that you know go above and beyond anything political. So let me get your take if you've crunched some numbers on this or have some other take on what this Ted Cruz, Mike Lee amendment might do. Now, these are very conservative senators who would just assume that pretty much everything be through the marketplace. So why would they be proposing that the full Obamacare package remain as a choice in states? And data-wise, what, what would that do to the price of people who need that full insurance? Yeah, so I haven't seen the full legislative text, but we know some things about what this bill would do. It kind of create these two parallel marketplaces. So as long as an insurer is selling these Obamacare plans that follow all the rules and regulations, they could also sell unregulated plans. Um, now, what that does is it's kind of a weird thing. So basically what that would mean is that you would have these plans that are skimpier, kind of offer less coverage, but are going to be a lot cheaper. And so you would have end up with people who don't have those health care needs, you know, um, you know, pregnant women are going to need to go into the place that sell, that offers maternity care, for example. And so those plans get cheaper, but the other ones get more expensive. And so essentially you create, um, you know, you can it can turn into a scenario where the marketplace plans are essentially a high risk pool. So that's people who are, um, you know, have health needs and sick um, you know, have, have high health care costs, and then the healthier people are in this other pool. But it creates a lot of instability. And so the uh, America's Health Insurance Plans, which is like the biggest um, health insurance industry um, group, came out today against that amendment. Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is pretty much the most important insurer in the marketplaces has also come out against it because it really destabilizes things. If you can, you know, suck all of the healthy people into this other marketplace that's cheaper and, you know, you leave behind people who have health care needs but yeah. are more costly and you to know treat. What's, you know what's funny about all this? The people who you're describing would be the most at risk. People in rural counties where this is falling apart and people who are... Um, older so they'd be bigger health risks and don't have great jobs. 
so that they don't have employer-based coverage to keep them out of the whole um, Obamacare mess. Um, those are Trump voters. That's almost the definition of Trump voters, middle-aged, underemployed people, and uh, people in the rural areas. So are they shooting their own voters in the foot with these reforms? Yeah, you know, that's a little bit tough. So on the one hand, what you're saying is true. On the other, the the people who are most helped by the Affordable Care Act tend to be pretty low income, like just above the poverty line. And those aren't necessarily the biggest Trump voters. I mean, that's a little bit of a misconception. It's much more middle class and, slit and, up and above who tend to be Trump voters. Mm -hmm. People who are really squeezed by the Affordable Care Act tend to be the folks who are the are middle income. So, you know, we're not talking about earning a ton of money, but earning forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. They saw their premiums skyrocket. And, and, you know, they really did go up, you know, 100%. Um, and, and that, you know, that group. So it's, it's a little bit of a push and shove. It's, it's a little unclear, though, how this all falls out because the law is very complex with a ton of interlocking pieces. It's hard to see how, how it ends up for everyone other than the fact that it's pretty clear that premiums go down for relatively healthy, higher income earners. They go up for lower. I, I gather people. there are some states that are doing a good job of enticing insurers into or to stay in their Obamacare marketplaces. Do you know how? Yeah, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can um, negotiate with the, so California negotiates, does like these active negotiations with insurers. Um, it, it helps when you just have more people who are uninsured, but you know, some somewhat middle income. Um, uh, there's there's like a variety of ways that you can work with the insurers to try and, and keep them in. But part of it is that if there's a healthy pool of people, right, like a mix, good mix of healthy and sick people, insurers are more likely to stay in because it's just a better stable market. Um, you know, there's also some things that the insurers did where some of them were pretty unrealistic about the prices they charged at the beginning. And if they price their plans too cheap, they lost a ton of money at the beginning, and that's really, really hard to recover from. And so a lot of the plans that did that, you saw them exiting pretty quickly from the marketplace, whereas people who had better pricing at the beginning tended to stay. So some plans have actually gotten cheaper. Some states have seen premiums go down, despite all the press coverage about the places where premiums are going up. They have. There have been a few states that saw, you know, small, but a little bit of a decrease, which is kind of crazy. You know, most people who have health insurance see their premiums go up every year a little bit at least. Um, you know, Massachusetts had largely adopted, for example, all of these rules well in advance of the Affordable Care Act. And so their marketplace is pretty stable and their prices have not really gone up. And it's, um, you know, they're in a pretty good situation. Some other states have seen much smaller increases as well. But then, you know, you do have states where there are really big problems. And some states have seen private insurers who have set up models specifically to make money while serving lower income people. Are you familiar with those? And is that an indication that the market, which is what Republicans want to emphasize more than government uh, insurance, can serve lower income people? Yeah, so there's there are companies like you're suggesting. So Blue Cross Blue Shield has sort of always had this in their ethos. There are other companies like Molina, um, where they have long served a low-income population. They also have a lot of people who are on Medicaid, but it's a managed care. So it's it's Medicaid, but it's run through a private insurance company. So they're very good at figuring out how to um, how to keep costs down for people who are sort of high risk low income, maybe have additional health care needs. And they have had, have had much more success because they know how to run these plans. The plans that largely served you know, employ, employers in the past and had mostly um, you know, providing employer-sponsored plans, they've had a much more difficult time because it's a really new population to them. These are people that they did not accept in the past. And how about the Medicaid piece? Medicaid, for younger viewers who don't know the origin story, was created in 1965 as part of the uh, war on poverty and the Lyndon Johnson administration. But it was also, I think it's fair to say, tied to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Do you see it in racial terms like that? 
Yeah, I think there's a pretty strong connection to the civil rights movement. Um, it was part of how hospitals were integrated, particularly in southern states in the 60s. Um, that wasn't necessarily, people didn't really know that that was going to be um, an outcome of the legislation when it first passed, but it was a very important way that um, the federal government was able to require states to see people of all races. Um, and so that's a imp really important history. I think the other thing that's kind of important there is the U.S. has this really weird health system where we tie health insurance to employment. And as that was becoming more solidified in the 60s, it became clear that there were these groups that at the time were seen as unlikely to have employment, right? And so that was people over 64 who weren't retired, and then also children, pregnant women, and certain parents. And so that's kind of where Medicaid came in. It was like these groups that they that the federal government felt like they were not going to have the opportunity to have an employer. And so they were going to, they, they needed some other alternative form of insurance. So what the Republican plan would do is end Medicaid as a guarantee for any American who wants health insurance who's in a low enough income group and instead provide block grants to the states and the states could make all those decisions. Is there data to indicate that that would disadvantage specific groups of people? Right. It's a little different. It allows um, for a per capita cap. So it's like a cap on how much can the federal government's going to contribute to different kinds of people. States could opt for a block grant where they just get a lump sum of money, but most are not likely to do that. Um, so with the per capita cap, it's, um, yeah, it's basically it's priced at the cost of coverage for different groups. So the way Medicaid works is there's, um, you know, there's children, there's pregnant women, there's people with disabilities, there's um, elderly um, or over 64 in nursing homes and long-term care. And they at, look at the average costs for each of those groups and they're basically gonna put it on a budget. And so instead of being open-ended how much could be spent and the federal government kicks in a percentage, um, there's going to be a limit to how much money could be contributed to those people. Uh -huh. so there's um, still... Yeah, there's some pretty the disability advocates are really concerned because everyone who qualifies under that disability category is um, some of them are going to be subject to that cap. And this is a group of people who have expensive health care needs and some of them won't. But it, it, a lot of people who currently have sort of an open ended um, you know, they can they can get whatever treatment they need. They're not going to they're going to be limits on how much can be spent on them. So, yes, there are people are really concerned and it's a big impact on state budgets. Very informative. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And stay with us, folks, as we bring on more health care evidence, this time on opioids. <laughs> Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. As senators spend months trying to find a version of health care reform they can agree on, one health emergency is growing by the day, the opioid epidemic. The New York Times Upshot column estimates deaths from opioid use rose to about 60,000 last year alone. That's more yearly U.S. deaths than from AIDS at the height of that epidemic in the mid-90s. The overdoses result from prescription drugs, heroin, and powerful synthetics such as fentanyl. In March, President Trump did sign an executive order which set up a national opioid commission headed by New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. The commission seeks to allocate funds, enhance access to treatment centers, and study the effectiveness of state prescription drug monitoring programs and ad campaigns. But is that enough, especially when at the same time, Trump could be poised to make the opioid crisis worse? A recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine argues that the GOP health care bill threatens to exacerbate the epidemic by reducing access to much needed medications. One of the authors of that article joins us now. Christina Andrews is a professor of social work at the University of South Carolina. The article is called How ACA, Affordable Care Act, Repeal Would Worsen the Opioid Epidemic. She joins us via Skype. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me today. So you wrote in this article that Obamacare, without targeting them specifically, 
help people who were addicted to opioids? How so? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I would say there are three main ways that Obamacare has really helped to address the nation's opioid epidemic. The first way is through um, the major health insurance expansions that the ACA has triggered that uh, many folks are familiar with. Uh, one is through the Medicaid expansion, through which about 17 million people um, got insurance for the first time. And the second is through uh, the state health insurance exchanges, through which people could sign up and access um, group uh, sponsored plans that were uh, offered through qualified health plans within these state exchanges. An additional 10 million people received coverage that way. Um, a second way is that the ACA helped to address um, the opioid epidemic was through the creation of what are called essential health benefits, um, or a set of health benefits that all insurance plans were uh, required to cover. Uh, both within the state Medicaid programs as well as within the exchanges. And substance abuse treatment was one of those uh, benefits that now all of these state Medicaid programs and insurance exchanges uh, were required to provide for, um, for people that were enrolled in their programs. And then the third way was through the extension of what are called parity requirements that were established through the mental health equity um, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, these were requirements that basically uh, required insurers to make sure that they were not placing um, any kinds of controls or limitations on use of um, services and treatment for addiction that were more um, stringent or more restrictive than those that they were placing on other kinds of healthcare services. Um, and so the impact of these changes for addiction treatment have been really significant. Um, and approximately 84 million people um, were able to basically get improved coverage and improve access to addiction service as a result of the expansion of those parity requirements. Um, and an additional 5 million people um, got substance abuse treatment um, coverage as part of their insurance plans for the first time as a result of the essential health benefits. So, so we're talking about a lot of people, um, as many as um, one in four Americans who uh, saw a substantial change in their coverage as a result of this. Would the Republican health care bills, the way they've been written so far, undo that parity? You know, there are limitations on access um, to addiction treatment um, that prior to, um, you know, Obamacare, there were a lot of restrictions on coverage and people were unable to access um, services that they needed um, and that were clinically indicated. Uh, Parity really changed that process by, um, you know, uh, making it um, easier for people to access those services that were that were clinically indicated. So the Republican bill would repeal the parity or no? Um, it would repeal um, uh, large sections of the parity. Um, unfortunately, um, the one of the things that um, the Republican bill uh, seeks to do, particularly the Better Care Reconciliation Act, um, you know, would be to um, allow uh, insurers to offer plans um, that uh, are basically bare bones and that don't provide those essential benefits. Um, the reason that they um, see this as a positive option is because it would allow insurers to offer those plans at a significantly um, reduced premium compared to some of the options that are on the market now. Um, but as they say, um, you get what you pay for. Um, and unfortunately, some folks who may opt to enroll into those plans uh, would find that in a time of need, if they were seeking um, treatment for opioid addiction, may, may not have coverage. Where does access mm -hmm. to medications come in specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these medications are absolutely essential. Um, you know, uh, at this point, decades of evidence have really shown us that um, access to medication for opioid addiction, and by that I mean methadone, buprenorphine, and uh, naltrexone, uh, plus psychotherapy are really the gold standard 
for treating opioid addiction. And um, there's been a growing consensus that um, there is a real need to increase access to these medications as a way to um, address the opioid epidemic. Um, the nation's national drug control policy, the Substance Abuse uh, and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, the Surgeon General, the National Institutes for Health have all um, endorsed these medications as the gold standard for treatment of opioid addiction, have been working hard to increase their access out in the field. Is there anything that you could say they could put into a repeal and replace bill that would guarantee decent care for people with opioid addiction, even if it wasn't under the Obamacare structure? Uh, access to health insurance coverage really is the key here. Um, you know, there's a growing understanding of opioid addiction, like all addictive disorders, as a chronic disease, that we need to think about it the way that we do diabetes or COPD. Um, this is a condition that once you have it, um, it's something that needs to be medically managed for life. Uh, even when you're in recovery, having the opportunity to have regular checkups and make sure that things are going well and that these kinds of grant-funded initiatives um, are really short-term solutions that don't address that chronic need, that chronic care approach that's really required. Um, and so what I would say is that we need to be moving in the opposite direction in terms of expanding uh, health insurance coverage rather than um, retracting and that I think that we need to um, consider um, some approach that would um, allow um, people who are, have an opioid addiction to be able to become eligible, uh, perhaps for a Medicaid program um, in the short term to, to get um, the treatment that they need during that process. Uh, I think a second thing that we need to do is have better integrated care. Um, right now, um, you know, there remains a lot of stigma around getting treatment for opioid addiction, and only about 80, 20 percent of people who have an opioid addiction ever get any treatment for their condition. And so um, we need to do a better job uh, integrating these services into primary care, um, which is a less stigmatized, more common place for people to get treatment, um, as well as outreach into schools and communities um, where we can find people who need help and move them into the system. Well, thank you very thank much you. for joining us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And that's our program for today. We're here each week at this hour pouring cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.